Dzień dobry. Witam Państwa bardzo serdecznie na kolejnym spotkaniu w ramach cyklu Elementy Architektury. Dzisiejsze spotkanie odbędzie się w trybie online. Językiem tego spotkania będzie język angielski. So, uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. I have this uh, privilege uh, to be the host of the fourth event organized uh, within the uh, series of the Elements of Architecture. Uh, this year, 2022, uh, Elements of Architecture are dedicated to the uh, saying that this very cycle uh, is being organized by the Institute of Architecture Foundation uh, in cooperation with the Goethe Institute uh, Krakow. Uh, we started in 2017 and uh, we are continuing this very cycle, uh, trying to focus on the uh, most current and most important topics dedicated to the architecture. Uh, this year, women architects, uh, we started already in May with the meeting with uh, Bal Architektek. Uh, then we had a meeting with FemArc uh, Collective from Berlin. Last uh, week, uh, we also host uh, a lecture by Helena Huber-Dudowa uh, dedicated to the oeuvre of uh, Vera Mahoninova, the first lady of the Czech brutalism. Uh, today, we are going to uh, go to Germany uh, to discuss the role of women architects uh, in the architecture practice in Germany. So I have this very big privilege to warmly welcome Professor Mary Pepczyński, a renowned scholar from America, uh, but uh, strongly connected to Germany and to the issue of the uh, gender uh, role in the uh, architecture practice in Germany. Uh, Professor uh, Perczyński, uh, she, uh, she's a professor um, uh, for architecture and society at the Technical University in Dresden. Uh, she studied in the US at the Columbia University in New York, uh, as well as at the University of Arts in Berlin. She researches about architecture and gender, and uh, her guest uh, professorships uh, in women's and gender studies uh, at the Technical University in Graz, it was in 2002, and the University of, of Applied Arts, uh, Applied Sciences uh, in Mainz uh, in 2017. Uh, she was the scientific advisor uh, to the Frau Architect, uh, over 100 years of women as architect at the Deutsches Architecture Museum. Uh, it was 2017, and this is the very exhibition that we are going to discuss this very um, evening. Uh, I should also say that Professor Pepczyński, uh, together with uh, Marian Simon, edited the book Ideological Equals Women Architects in Socialist Europe, 1945-1990. It was published in London, 2000, uh, 2016. Uh, as well as uh, uh, with Christina Bude, uh, she's currently editing a book Women Architects and Politics in the Long 20th Century which is going to be published in Bielefeld in 2022. But this very evening is dedicated to uh, Frau Architect, Zeit Mern al Jahrhundert Jahre Frauen in uh, Architekten uh, Burf, uh, over 100 years of women as a profession architects in Germany. Professor Pepczyński, tell us how it was. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, really warm introduction, and I'm absolutely delighted to be with you and uh, greetings to everyone in Krakow. So, Frau Architect. Frau Architect took place between September 30th, 2017 and March 8th, International Women's Day um, 2018 at DAM, the Deutsches Architekturmuseum or the German Architecture Museum in Frankfurt Main in Germany. And now my, how do I forward this now? Leave, okay. yeah. It doesn't want to go there. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, it was a, a complex undertaking. It was an exhibition, meaning an alternative history of architecture in Germany in the 20th and 21st centuries, 
with female Seems protagonists. Um, it was seven films about nine women who are currently practicing architecture or have practice in diverse contexts in Germany. It was a series of lectures and events of which very broadly considered women and architecture, gender and work and the built environment in contemporary society. Why? Well, there were several reasons. Here we see some statistics from 2012. They're, they're about 10 years old, but the, they roughly remain accurate from Germany, Switzerland, Great Britain, and Austria. In black, we see men and women in architecture school, blue when they go out in the world and they're practicing architecture. Compare, when we compare school to uh, practice, we see there's a great gender inequality in the profession. Women leave the profession earlier and more often. They rarely attain the highest and most prestigious positions in architecture. They own their own office or a big office. In Germany, a professorship is very important and we have relatively few women professors. Um, their work isn't published as often as their male colleagues, et cetera. There's structural problems in practice. There's a lot of inequality. There's discrimination still. Uh, women are not always taken seriously when they want to advance. And uh, it still remains difficult in many places in Germany to combine work and family. Um, of course, when women drop out uh, or when everyone, anyone who drops out, they, they use their skills for other purposes. They don't necessarily stop working altogether. And interestingly, uh, this is the focus of, of some current EU research about architects after architecture when they drop out. And of course, it's a gender issue. How do these, how do people use these skills when they leave architecture? But that's another theme. In any event, women study architecture in great numbers, but they do not go on to practice and remain in architecture um, as much as men do. And in Germany, these are the statistics are about 10 years old, but they're roughly remain accurate. We see that 53% of the students are female today. It's probably more like 60, 47 men. But when you go into practice, we see here 73% of the registered architects are men, 27 are women. So their numbers in, um, in school just don't repeat them when they go on to practice. Another problem that or another issue in Germany is that even though it's 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall, there are different ideas about gender in East and West Germany. And of course, everything is changing. This is 30 years ago, but ideas and, um, and ideologies uh, are often very hard to um, erase and to replace with new ideas. In uh, West Germany, it was very, very typical, remains typical that when a woman has her children, she should stay home and take care of them. So you have to choose, do I have a family or do I have a career? And in East Germany, under socialism, it was very typical. It was normal for a woman to have a career and have children. There was extensive daycare, and there was no prejudice against women who brought their children to daycare. So, of course, this is all changing. Um, and again, the situation is a little bit more complicated. But you, one can detect different attitudes towards women, family, and work in the different parts of Germany. Okay. Um, another issue, and this was for Dam for the for the architecture museum that sponsored Trail Architect, is that architecture institutions are part of the problem too. And by that we mean museums, professional journals, universities, organizations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Dam, for example, was founded in 1984. Since 1984, they've had an approximately a hundred exhibitions about. May, about architects, so individual exhibitions, but only four of them were about women. So if we just saw the last statistic, 27% should have been women and not four. So of course, in many institutions, there's a lot of work to do. And then finally, uh, another motivation for the exhibition was that as in many other places in Europe right now, where there have been similar events that have been organized, publications, conferences, et cetera, 
for example, events in Zurich, London, Stockholm, Prague, Tallinn, Lisbon, Paris, the, the list goes on and on. Um, the impact of feminism, that is looking at those who are marginalized and typically pushed to the margins, and the attempt to then take those on the margins and bring them back into the center of the story, as though those have been marginalized due to gender, ethnicity, age, class, sexuality, etc. Uh, this process of taking those on the edge, bringing them to the center, and then uh, making that public um, is a process that's going on right now in different contexts. And of course, women are part of this greater reconsideration. So we're part of this larger movement to look at the what's going on in the margins and try to bring it to the center. So those are some of the motivations for Frau Architect. Who? Who made the exhibition? Well, it was a combined effort of many, many people. But many thanks to Peter Schmal, who is the director of DAM and is still the director of DAM and is involved in all the projects of DAM. Christina Buddha, who was the curator of public um, education at DAM. She's not an architect, but has a very strong social interest in architecture. Myself, um, uh, Christina is now retired. I'm also actually now just retired from the TU Dresden where my professor dealt with architecture theory and the connection to, between architecture and society. And I've done a lot of research on women architects with students, so that was my expertise. And last but not least, Wolfgang Vogt, also retired, but was the former deputy director at DAM. He's a historian, and he very uh, strongly pushed to have gender issues be considered a dam. So architecture viewed in a new light. And a shout out to Hannah Spikers, who was one of our many assistants who assist us in many, many ways. So here we see the beginning of many people who have put Frau Architect together. We were also had generous support from uh, the Kulturstiftung des Bundes, so the German Cultural Foundation. And we had many sponsors and another important sponsor was the Friends of Dam, so a group that supports the museum. So let's start with the exhibition. At the heart of Frau Architect, uh, the Frau Architect project was a historical exhibition. Dam as an institution is part architecture center where you look at contemporary themes and part museum where there's an archive and you look at historical issues. So the exhibition was a way of putting these two aspects of DAM together, looking at a contemporary issue, but with a focus on the past to come back to the present. The exhibition, as I mentioned, uh, is an alternative history of modern architecture in Germany from roughly 1900 to 2017. At the heart of the exhibition are biographies of 22 women architects born between 1875 and 1966. And through telling their stories, we broadly examine issues such as how women challenged widespread prejudice together uh, against feminine ability to study, receive commissions, and practice architecture. And we look at the first architects, we go through many different phases, and then we look at women who are practicing today as well. Um, here we see the first floor galleries at DAM. DAM is uh, the museum. It's currently being renovated if you go to Frankfurt, but uh, the museum is located in an old villa um, on the Main River in Frankfurt, in downtown Frankfurt. And it was uh, renovated to use as a museum in 1984 by Oswald Matthias Ungers. So this is the planning from Ungers that most exhibitions have to grapple with in some way. Anyway, the 22 women were organized roughly thematically into seven groups. The emergence of women architects um, between 1900 and 1914, modernism in the 1920s, the Nazi era in the 30s and 40s, the theme migration, exile, return migration, which spans several decades, post-war rebuilding and the post-war city, public architecture and urbanism from 1970 to 1990, and then building in Berlin after 1989 as a, well of, as a way of thinking about building since reunification. Here we see the plan of the first floor gallery at Dam, where the exhibition took place. And in the center of the gallery, 
was uh, a square space, a uh, uh, space that's square in plan. And this space was used as a small cinema. And I'm going to tell you about the cinema then and what we did there then later in the talk. As I mentioned, we um, our protagonists were grouped into seven, roughly seven different themes. I'll just tell you a little bit about them. Um, our first group were the first, we, we picked three women, of course there were more, but uh, to explain how did women architects start in Germany, women were not officially allowed to study at a university in Germany until 1909, although at all German universities. Um, each situation is a little bit complicated to explain, but very often the first women, they were able to visit a university, take courses, but not do an official diploma. So they would always leave without a degree, without a qualification. This technically was not a problem in Germany. Uh, you were no, not required to study until into the 1960s. So if you didn't have a degree, it really wasn't a problem, but a degree was important for a woman to tell everyone that she really did study, really does know what she's doing and can really go out there and, and plan and build that building. So this was one of the first hurdles and probably the first woman to open her own office is the woman that we see over in the top left, Amelia Winkelmann. Her family had a very large construction company. She studied at a guest at a university in Hanover and opened her own office in Berlin around 1907 and got many commissions from actually women clients, wealthy women. The next woman, woman that we see is Therese Mugger, also came from a wealthy family, studies around 1907, does not receive a degree and is able to build because she's very wealthy and she buys um, she buys property and builds houses on them. And I'll tell you a little bit about more her later. And another woman that we see here is uh, Princess Victoria zu Bentham in Steinfurt. And among the first women architects in Germany, we have a number of aristocratic women who were very wealthy, who were able to study. They had enough money, they were able to study. And it was important for them to know how to build, know about landscaping, know about architecture, because this is important to their family. They're going to go back to their ancestral lands or what they've inherited. And it's important for the good name of the family to know how to build something, to be able to build it up. Um, and a lot of aristocratic women were also involved in the First World War, uh, supporting the German army, women architects. So those are our first three. And then our, our themes sort of go on then through women uh, in, during modernism in the 1920s. We also, it was important to show that women were not always the good people in history. And we show Gertie Trost, who was Hitler. She was basically an interior designer, but she was very important for Hitler, did a lot of propaganda work for him uh, of architecture and then uh, publicized that. Uh, also, the theme of migration, exile, return migration that you see here is it was very important for us as well, um, because women would be moving in and out of Germany. So how do we begin to tell that story and also the work that they did? Then we see uh, the different women, for example, Lucy Hillebrand or um, Vera Meyer Baldick, uh, Gerrit uh, Breuer Revelio or Lotte Stambeza, who were active either in Germany or uh, in other places in Europe during rebuilding. And then finally, our last group, it's uh, many names here, but we have women who are involved in public architecture and urbanism from roughly 1960 to 1990, who make different contributions, including Maretta Matern, who was basically active as a theoretician. Uh, so she made sculptures, drawings, thinking about landscape and architecture has incredible oeuvre that really should be investigated further. We see Iris de Lingrund, who was the head city architect in the city of New Brandenburg in eastern Germany and built, she was the most famous woman architect in East Germany and built an extraordinary amount in the city. We see um, Sigrid Kressmann Schach, who was probably one of the most important businesswomen in Western Europe. She had a big building company in West Berlin. She built a lot of uh, she she bought a lot of properties and built a lot of she built a lot of West Berlin until the early 70s. Uh, we see then Verena Dietrich, who was very active in Cologne, built a lot of architecture out of steel and created her own feminist movement as well and published a book and tried to organize women in Ger German speaking Europe to become feminist architects. 
Then we see Gertrude Schillem, who uh, was active in Jena in Eastern Germany for the Carl Zeiss Company. She developed planetarian structures with very innovative uh, cast concrete constructions. They were exported worldwide for foreign export for East Germany, and she also traveled worldwide to build them. And then Ingeborg Kuhler, who was the first woman in West Germany to receive a professorship at the highest level at a university. She does this in the mid-1980s because she won a major competition for a museum in Mannheim that took 10 years to complete. And she was a very, very famous, she's still alive and a very famous architect. And then we have two architects who are very well known in Germany today, and they are practicing in Berlin, Gesine Weinmuller and Almut Gwinchuk Ernst. So we kind of uh, talk a lot about the first women who were practicing, who they were, what were their what were their challenges, and then how we get to today. I know I left out a few figures here, but I'm going to get to them in a second. Um, it was also important to tell us um, not just one story, but kind of rewrite the history of modernism. And it was important for us. We couldn't tell about every single person who was working. But we picked out certain people and tried to make us, our, our visitors kind of reconsider what they've learned about German modernity. For example, many well-known German modernists didn't work alone, but they had a collaborator, and that collaborator was a woman. For example, many of the famous projects that you know from the 1920s and the 1930s from Mies van der Rohe were worked on together with Lily Reich and all the furniture that you know from Mies van der Rohe really was designed with Lily Reich or by Lily Reich. She was also an expert exhibition designer and you know that Mies is known for his exhibition designs. Well, she, she produced them. Um, another figure is Marlena Moschkopolczyk. We were just talking about her. And from around 1917 to the early 30s when they stopped practicing, she and Hans Holzig collaborated very, very closely. She was a very talented artist and a sculptor, and much of the sculptural work from Polzig at this period can be attributed to her. And right next to them is, um, uh, without a red box, is uh, Margaret Schutteli-Hutzke, who is a very well-known figure in Frankfurt because she contributes to the Ernst Mies New Frankfurt Project, and people still talk about her in Frankfurt today. So, so just... Uh, how we began to kind of uh, reanimate how we think about history and, and who should be included. Um, it was also important to show, for example, we all know about the Bauhaus, but actually a number of women studied at the Bauhaus, women architects. Uh, there were women architecture students at the Bauhaus, and many of them went on to have very impressive careers. And two uh, women we see here, Vera Meyer Waldeck, who was active in Bonn, and Lotte Stambeza, who ends up in Rotterdam and is very involved then in post-war rebuilding in Rotterdam. But it's not so much that they went to the, ba or the Bauhaus, they were architects and they were able to have a career, but their gender often impacted how far they were able to come or the chances that they would then eventually have in their career. Um, it was also important for us to say women architects uh, in Germany and not necessarily German women architects, and this might be an issue for you as well if you, if you do an exhibition, because not all our women mm -mm, have a German passport. Um, Margaret uh, Schutteli Hutzke comes from Austria. She's Austrian. She marries a German. She becomes German. They, they're divorced, and then she's Austrian again. Uh, Marie Frommer is actually born in Warsaw. She grows up in Germany. She has a very important practice there, but she goes into exile in New York. Lotta Stambeza, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of Cohen uh, eventually migrates to Mande, Palestine, Israel in the 1920s, eventually Israel. And Carola Bloch is born in Łódź, Poland, but she studies, works all over Western Europe, is in exile in the United States, is, plays an influential role in East German architecture in the 50s, and eventually then goes to the Federal Republic. Um, and another figure, of course, is Lada Stambeza, who starts out in Germany and, and ends up in Holland. So this question of national identity or, or nationalism wasn't really a good framework for us. So we chose in Germany and not German women architects. Another uh, issue here, we didn't um, 
isolate the women who are working in an, in, on, under socialism in East Germany. And the two, Erstelin Grund and Gertrude Schiller, are still alive. They were at our opening and went to many events with us. And they were very grateful because they didn't you know, see themselves as, as something, this isolated thing, this other, but really part of this whole larger story about German modernity in the 20th century. So they were very happy in that we integrate them in this larger story. And of course, when I'll show you how we presented the architects, people would understand where they were working, but uh, we felt these larger themes were more important than, than really calling out East and West. Finally, the theme of um, mothers, when uh, again, I mentioned that there are different attitudes towards women and work uh, in still remain in, in different parts of Germany. And the first tour that I gave about the exhibition to a West German journalist, a really wonderful person who was very curious, the first thing he asked me was how many of them were mothers? How many of them have children? So 12 of them were mothers, roughly 55%. And um, again, this is still very much an issue in Germany today about uh, how far can one combine family and work. Um, it's more of a theme in West Germany. Uh, I worked for many years in, in Dresden in former East Germany. And there, this no one would ask me a question like that. So it's still these old attitudes towards women and work are still present in Germany today. And this is other another theme we attempted to, uh, to kind of bring up and reflect upon in the exhibition. What did we show? Well, uh, finding exhibits was a challenge. Museums typically do not collect the papers of women architects, or there are projects by women in their collections. They just, they always would tell me, oh, we don't have any. And after I had found 10 things, they'd say, gee, isn't that interesting? So they're not often taken seriously. Um, Dam had the papers of two women architects. We see here Lily Hillebrand, uh, Lucy Hillebrand, and uh, two of about 65, by the way. So we used uh, these two architects in the exhibition. And then we had to find uh, works in other museums and archives. A lot of work was in private possession. Um, but I also found things on eBay, you know, on, on the internet, and I would buy books or postcards or magazines. So it was a real kind of adventure just trying to get the information together to present. Um, over the course of three semesters, students and colleagues at the Technical University in Dresden very generously held seminars to research buildings by women architects, and they built uh, nine architects for the exhibition, as we see here. Um, as mentioned, sometimes museums and archives have work by women architects, but it is not properly identified, or it's listed under the name of a male architect. Um, and Dam had a small collection of really wonderful color drawings that you see here of the Great Theater, also known as the Große Schauspielhaus, that was a, a renovation completed in Berlin in 1919. And these drawings, the whole project, you can see the photos there, has been attributed to Hans Polzig. A new research that's gone on for a number of years now has shown that the drawings were actually made by Marlena, or they both worked on them. They had different ways of drawing. And if you know how Hans drew and how Marlena drew, you could see which was a collaborative effort and which was done by her. So we just went to the archive. We identified the ones that we can really say are by Marlena. And we put these, for example, on the wall uh, to give her her due. And this actually happened for two other women as well, where work that had been attributed to men um, actually was done by women. And we were able then to, to show that in the exhibition. It was also important for us to show a lot of photos of women architects and women in action. So not a pretty portrait, but really doing the work of, a, of an architect. And how does gender complicate that story? So at the top, we see some photos, Amelia Winkelmann, the first woman architect in Germany, Margarete Schutterli-Hotzky at the Frankfurt um, building uh, office. It's sort of a portrait, uh, an office portrait, and then Marie Fromer at her desk, uh, sort of the first generation of women architects. Uh, these are, are sort of uh, uh, pictures that are made for a publication. So they were, they were organized. 
Below we see, um, and we really tried to get more of these kind of photos as you see below, the ones that are more spontaneous that tell us what it was really like to be a woman architect. Left we see um, Aristeline Grun. She was the chief, the most important woman architect in East Germany, the chief city architect of New Brandenburg. She oversees a city extension for 50,000 people. And she's presenting her scheme to, these are some very important architects and planners in East Germany. And you can see how bored and skeptical they look and how, with how much vigor and energy she's presenting her work, what that must have been like. And then next to it, we have Almut Grundtuk Ernst. Um, this is a photo from her, uh, her Berlin office together with her husband, Armin Grundtuk. He's in the front on the right with the white um, shirt and other colleagues, they're working on a competition, like all the architects are looking at the competition, it's only the baby who's looking at the camera, if you look closely and knows that someone's taking their picture. But these kind of images kind of told us more about what it was like to be a woman architect as these carefully staged photos. So again, looking at women in action, women architects in action was important for us to show. How did we present the different um, the different women architects. Each one got a little mini exhibition, as you see here. Here, I'm going to present you Therese Mugger. Her dates are 1875 to 1959, and she was one of the first women architects in Germany. Um, typically, we had a board which had a photo, uh, a text in German and English, and then on the wall, we had different things, photos, drawings, you know, whatever we felt like, sometimes models or whatever. For a number of women, there was actually artwork made about the woman, and we tried to also have a, a model of one of, their, um, one of their works as well. Um, and then we had a vitrine or a table, and then in there we could also put also additional information that told about her, her journey in architecture. And here we see uh, she was one of the first women architects, so um, most people thought that women were couldn't think in three dimensions, were not technically uh, capable, so who would trust a woman architect to build something? They must have been crazy. So we show here what she does in order to um, in order to get clients so she can build. Well, she becomes her own client. Uh, and above, we see a little um, a multifamily house in Dusseldorf. There was an area that was a new area. She went there. She was very wealthy. She bought property and she started building houses like this. And this is how she met other people and then built other similar houses nearby. On the right, we see a newspaper, Unser House, Our House. She made her own newspaper with ideas about architecture and building. She published her designs as a way of getting clients to show people what she could do. Um, we also showed other aspects of her life as, a, as an early woman architect. We showed her, her triangle, her wooden triangle. I think an older generation knows what a triangle is, what it's like to draw with that, maybe not a younger one. We also show she had three children. She was very wealthy. She married very young, had three children, divorced her husband, and then decided to study architecture and become an architect. But of course, there's a lot of compromises there, and this was not an easy solution, uh, decision to make at all. She was wealthy. She sent her children to boarding school. But we had a postcard that we found in her papers where the, her sons write to her, Mama, why don't you write to us? So they're at school and they're waiting to hear from Mama. So here we see a portrait of a woman who's, who's a pioneer. She's trying to be an architect, what she has to do professionally, and then the struggles she also has in her private life. And then on top, we found this, these two, they're actually very, very small photos in her papers. She's the woman with the little bow tie that we see here. There's another woman that you see in the picture who's a little bit shorter. Um, that's Elizabeth von Knobelsdorf. She's the first woman, to, woman in Germany to actually do the diploma degree. Um, and they're both studying here at the Technical University in Munich around 1907, we think. I mean, they're funny. That's showing people fooling around in the studio. But perhaps the other thing you should know about here is when this image was made, the first generation of women, they tended to study much later. They, there was a lot more resistance or they had to convince their families or, or do whatever or convince the universities to let them go there. They tended to be quite a bit older than the, 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 the men who were sitting next to them. And Elizabeth von Knobelsdorf in this picture is 30 years old. And Therese Mugger, the other one with a little bow tie here, 
She is 32 years old and a mother of three children. So activity, you might think these are, you know, teenage kids fooling around, but they're actually, they're actually quite, quite a bit older than most of the kids in school. So that was, uh, those were other issues that when we talk about the vitrines and what we showed there, it wasn't just their work, but really what they experienced in architecture and in architectural culture. We also had a, a catalog that we produced and I'll, um, um, and the catalog, um, it was published in 2017. It's published in German and English, and it, there's approximately 30 essays in the catalog. Um, we had portraits of the 22 women architects, so stories about the women and their work, their lives, their work, et cetera. But we also had texts about gender work and architecture in historical and contemporary contexts. And we had authors from Germany, the Netherlands, Israel, Spain, Belgium, and the United States, and I'm probably forgetting someone. So it wasn't just Germans writing about German women in Germany. We also uh, took a, more of an international focus and invited people who were researching these women and their lives um, to contribute as well. Um, so what happens, um, I was, and of course, our, our, our goal here was to kind of influence discussions about women, gender, architecture, we think how we think about architecture. And I find it interesting to see how libraries and bookstores integrate uh, our catalog into their display and into their collections. And um, I was recently in Mendrisio in Switzerland at the Academy of Architecture, which is the uh, architecture school of Italian speaking Italy. And in their beautiful new library, Frau Architect is actually on the shelf with German architecture. So it's right there. And on the other side is you see the bookstore Pro Quadratmeter in Berlin, which is an excellent architecture theory design bookstore. Frau Architect is under architecture theory. So I find it interesting here, they don't quite know where to put her, but it doesn't really matter because they're trying to integrate her into really the center of discussion and not put it off to the side um, in, in something more peripheral. So I found that interesting and I was actually quite happy to see how, how she was being integrated into this bigger story. We also made films. Um, we made seven films featuring nine women architects. The concept was developed by Christina Buddha, who we see here, who was the public education curator at DAM. And the films were made by a young filmmaker in Frankfurt, Sophia Edschmidt, and we see Sophia here. And as I mentioned in the planning for the German Architecture Museum, O.M. Ungers designed this space in the middle of the galleries. Uh, which is roughly square in plan. It goes through the whole building. It's conceptually, it's the house in the house. And all exhibitions really have to deal with the space for better or worse. So we decided to use it then as a cinema. So this is more of a closed space. And, um, and actually it worked quite well. Um, making these seven films was a way of making history come alive. You can look at photos and drawings and models and read a lot of text. But when you hear people then talking about their lives, the whole thing takes on a new quality. And our seven films explore phases of a woman's journey, journey in architecture from young students to older professionals in their 70s and the 80s. And we featured uh, women who were born between 1991 and 1933. They're looking with anticipation to what's going to happen. They're right in the middle of their career or they're looking back upon their experiences. So they discuss their hopes, aspiration, and experiences. And also how they dealt with prejudice and um, how being a woman in architecture has changed them and their perception of architectural practice. And um, I forgot to mention about the women in the exhibition, but it was important for us to select uh, uh, women from a diverse places in Germany. So they're not all from Berlin, they're from many different places, big cities, small towns, and also different kinds of architectural practice. And that was our strategy here. So the women that you see here, they come from different places in Germany and their practice, although they're all practicing architecture, what they do specifically um, is all very different and they're all very successful. So we begin with two students, Eileen Igotz and Micah Kimmel, who were students at the Technical University in Darmstadt and the FH Frankfurt, so the two architecture faculties in, in the Frankfurt Main area. 
And uh, they're basically talking about what they've experienced and what they hope to encounter when they go out and start working. They're, of course, graduates now. Our next are Kathleen Schultz and Kathleen Sievers. And they studied at FH Bremen. They work in Bremerhaven. They were able to open their own office very quickly after their studies. And they have a very small two-woman office that's actually received a lot of attention for their work, very sensitive work in local contexts. Uh, the next is Anna Herringer. You might have seen her work at the Venice Biennale. She's known for an expert on lame or mud brick or stamped earth architecture. She builds mainly in Asia um, social welfare projects. And she talks how what's expected of her, she's sort of uh, becoming a star architect, so what's expected of her and what she rejects because she uh, doesn't want to put in, let's say, the long hours and the exhausting travel that's necessary for that kind of career. Our next is Susanna Hoffman. She's German but worked in Berlin and London. And when she decided to stay in Berlin, she developed... Um, a way of, of um, developing projects where the users were very intensely um, incorporated into the process, often with very surprising aesthetic and architectural results. So it's a very collective way of practicing. The next was Marie Therese Deutsch, who's a very well known architect in Frankfurt Main, who's done a lot of public projects there and was is a really a very well known figure in the city. Then we have Ingeborg Kuhler, who I mentioned before. She was the first uh, woman professor at the highest level at a German architecture faculty and uh, also designed a very big museum in Mannheim, which is really quite beautiful and it's wonderful to visit. And then Iris de Lingrund, who was really the most famous East German woman architect. So these were our films. They're, they're quite short, but they everybody tells a little bit about their life their life in architecture and, and reflects upon that. And so those were the films that we, um, we then developed. Um, events, there were a lot of events. So Frau Architectures wasn't the exhibition, the catalog and the films, but there were a lot of events as well. And uh, the museum kind of either, they happened in the museum or in many, many places, basically in Frankfurt or the area around Frankfurt. We had two international conferences. We had numerous collaborations with uh, institutions in Frankfurt Main, like the Film Museum and the Jewish Museum, many projects with local universities, the TU Darmstadt at seminars, FA Frankfurt had a lecture series. Uh, we had public lectures where uh, the City Plus series, there were themes like the city and feminism, very broad um, issues that were related to the themes we addressed in the exhibition, just to get the, the public to come in, look at the exhibition, start talking and discussing. And uh, we had one symposium that was phenomenal. They were all so incredibly well visited. One was just broke all the limits. Yes, we plan with practicing women architects. And you see a picture here. And this was organized by um, women. Uh, the different chambers of architects in Germany have little subgroups. And most of them have a, a, a group for women or gender women architects. And we gave this over to them. They organized it. They basically then all came to Frankfurt. They wanted to come on Sunday because they said we either have childcare or we don't have to go to our building sites on Sunday. So they all came to Frankfurt and they had a symposium with international guests and then they visited different projects in Frankfurt as well. So this is where women who are practicing created their own event. Um, so it wasn't just the exhibition and the catalog and all the traditional things, but really getting this theme discussed in many ways as possible. And then all the major German architecture faculties, the technical universities, they either did a seminar or involved in this project in some way or another. Um, okay, so, so the idea, um, the idea for our architect was not just to uh, have it happen one time, but but to kind of continue having an impact as a, continuing these reflections and, and discussions about architecture and gender in the broadest way. And a digitalized version with the models uh, traveled to Hamburg in 2019 to uh, that was the Museum of uh, Museum of Work to the Zurich Architecture Center in 2020 and to the Dusseldorf House of Architects in 2020. In 2020, so as you see here, we kind of created a flexible framework. The work was digitalized and um, 
the different uh, locations could take pieces, add on, leave something away, uh, combine it with other uh, other themes or people. For example, in Hamburg here, they added Hamburg architects, or they did the same thing in Zurich and in Dusseldorf. So the idea was we created kind of a flexible framework that could be adapted to the different uh, contexts. Unfortunately, uh, the pandemic hit. There was a phenomenally well visited. Um, uh, uh, opening reception to the Frau Architect in Zurich. And of course, this is at the end of February. So by early March, it was unfortunately it was closed. It did reopen a little bit in the summer with a limited visiting. And then there were some uh, public events that happened then later on. And this, and then Frau Architect in Dusseldorf, that was in the summer. And there was in a, a, under different uh, certain conditions, limited conditions, it could be shown. Um, so that was, it, it did go on, but the last two stops were a little bit uh, limited. But what's happened is um, in the past, I guess since 2021 now, uh, there's been, the digital version has been traveling in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and now in Europe through Goethe Institute. And last year, we, uh, when it was shown in Izmir, it was all online. So there was a selection of Frau Architect, the German architects, there was a parallel exhibition of Turkish women architects, which was actually quite fascinating to see where the themes were similar and where they were very, very different. And we had a series of online events as well. So the whole the whole show was online and you can still go to their website, Kadim Memar, and you can see the exhibition there. And then it traveled in a similar way. It was been in Athens. It's been in, I have to see here, Nicosia, and it's currently traveling now through different places in Romania. So our idea, again, was to make a flexible format, uh, really encouraged broad discussion about women and architecture, gender, and the built environment, encourage then the different stations where it then goes out to visit to then create their own exhibition, and our two events kind of complement one another. And in this way, we hope to kind of uh, get a broader discussion um, going. Um, reception. Pro Architect was reviewed by about 125 magazines in Germany, not just architecture magazines, newspapers, uh, women's lifestyle, online sites, you name it. And it was incredible the reaction that we had. We had negative reaction. It was called a women's ghetto and women's exhibitions discriminate against women. But that was in the minority. The most were either they were curious, they talked about it, they reacted, they didn't know what to think. It was too feminist, it wasn't feminist enough, but it didn't matter. I mean, the point was to get people thinking about the themes that we raised in the exhibition. Um, so that's sort of the media, the press. But if you visited Frau Architect, you could also react to it as well. We see here on the left was the entrance to the gallery and you could walk around the cinema in the middle. You have the cinema, you can go see the exhibition, you could go to the cinema. And then when you're finished, you would go to the message wall. And the message wall was right by the exit, as you see here. You could sign something if you wanted in a little book, or you could take a little piece of paper, make a drawing, write a comment, do whatever you want, and hang it up on the wall and do that anonymously. We had, of course, in German, as you can imagine, but we had many, many, Frankfurt is an incredibly international city, and we had many, many different languages, and very often I would find a little scrap of paper, and we would spend a couple of days figuring out what language it was to, to get it translated. So that was actually very interesting to see the wealth of reaction and also the different places people were coming from. Um, and sometimes the museum would scan something and they'd put in the internet and people would react to it. And this one went viral. We call it Buttercup. And a young woman architect wrote, five years after my diploma and professional experience in London and Cologne, I quit architecture. Too much bullying and misogyny from bosses and colleagues. Why am I doing this to myself? Not for my sake. Woman architect, 32, quote from the boss, toughen up, buttercup. Really now? So we posted this. We were posting a lot. And this one just took off. It was shared 80 times. People were commenting like, oh, this is what all the offices are like, or this is so horrible. Or there were offices that would then write, we think this is terrible. We make sure that everybody in our office is very happy. Please come and work for us. She actually got a job offer here. 
Sometimes people posted pictures of their offices showing how many women work there. I mean, it, it really it really just touched a nerve. So it just shows that the playing field in architecture is not even, people don't quite, quite know how to express it, but they really know that for all women today, uh, they don't always feel comfortable in architecture. And this is certainly one reason why they leave. So, but other positive things happened. So that was that was sort of touched nerve, but there've been other reactions as well. We did really make the issue of women architects more visible in Germany. And one change that came fairly quickly was the Bund Deutsche Architekten. I'm sure you've heard of them, or BDA or BDA. It's a federation of German architects. It literally means the federation of German male architects. They've officially now changed their name, and they are the Bund Deutsche Architektinnen und Architekten. So women architects now have a presence in the name of this honorary society. By the way, in Germany, we now officially have three genders. You can also be gender non-binary, but that's another uh, discussion about making that present. But in, in any way, there, there was an attempt to see uh, arch who makes architecture more broadly. Um, and what kind of inspired them to do this was that probably Therese Mugger, who we met before, was probably the first member of the BD. They are the, the Federation of German Architects, and she probably joined around 1920 in Dusseldorf. So they did some research. They figured out it was probably Therese Mugger, and that's why they decided to change it. Another nice um, story, I'm not quite sure what's gone on here, but uh, we were uh, the whole uh, campus of architecture in Dresden is going, will be undergoing a process of um, renovation and, and renewal and, and repair. And the new president of the university, a woman, uh, asked the different faculties to suggest important people who are connected with the university who are women to propose them as names uh, for future buildings or representative spaces like a lecture hall. And uh, our, the faculty of architecture, we nominated Marie Fromer. We see her here. She's one of the first architects in Germany. She was actually born in Warsaw. She grew up in Germany. She actually built like several other early women architects in East Prussia, so today in Poland, during the First World War. She briefly worked in Dresden. She was the first woman in Germany to write a doctorate in architecture. And she wrote a doctorate about urbanism and architecture at the Technical University. She goes on to have a very successful practice first in, in Berlin, and then she goes into exile and then further in New York. But she was an architect in the public intellectual and probably in another era, she would have had a professorship and written many books. She's a very interesting figure. So we, we suggested that a lecture hall be named after Marie Fromer. I haven't heard about it, but again, you can see kind of what can happen when you make an exhibition and, and there's more awareness about uh, people uh, who make the people who are making architecture and their stories and their lives. Postscript, um, as was mentioned, we had uh, two international conferences uh, for Frau Architect and one Women Architects in Politics in the Long 20th Century, which is a very timely theme. Um, we had a number of colleagues who presented, we've gathered their papers, and it will be published now this August by, by transcript uh, publishers in Bielefeld. And I have an article about Frau Architect, how uh, my contribution to the making of Frau Architect and, and looking back what we what we got right or, or, or other ways of looking at the exhibition. And Christina Buddha also has a, her contributions to Frau Architect and her perspective on the exhibition. So we, um, uh, so if you're interested uh, and you're curious to read more about the Frau Architect project, uh, you might be interested in looking at this and as well as the many other excellent uh, essays that are here. And by the way, it's going to be open access. It will be a limited open access probably through educational institutions. So it'd be easy. It's very easy to, to read it when it comes out finally in August. So thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for such a talkative, uh, informative and inspiring lecture, uh, getting us uh, access uh, to the discourse of German history and history of women in German architecture. Uh, I should start with reminding that there is an opportunity to ask questions to Professor Pepczyński, 
using the chat uh, of the Facebook of the Institute of Architecture, I see already two questions. Uh, the first one comes from Professor Dorota van Tuchmatla. There is a group of women architects in Poland who states that uh, they have never came across the problem of discrimination, problems with marrying professional and private life, etc. Presenting the attitude like, if the problem doesn't concern me, means that it does not exist apparently, or it's a minor importance. There appear suggestions that everything depends only on one's strong character and determination, what seems to lessen the skills and potential of women who apparently and simply weaker. Uh, are they really? Is it always about being strong or weak? This attitude does not help to change the general situation. Is there also a similar gap uh, within German women architects in Lier? Yeah, I mean, very much so. And I think um, there were, as I mentioned, there were many, many reactions to Frau Architect. And one reaction that we had was, I think was on the message wall was, uh, what is your problem? I have a head, mm. I have two hands, right? I go in the office every day and work, like, what are you talking about? So, and that is maybe a shorter way to say what you said, but you know, I just go there, I do my work, you know, I take myself seriously, I'm taken seriously, where is the problem? And I think a lot of, um, you have to see it in an intersectional way. There have been people who've been able to work in architecture to practice architecture with a lot of privilege or with very relatively few barriers. And I mentioned our princess at the very beginning and she actually built a phenomenal amount of projects, renovated things, I mean, it's landscape projects. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal what she did in roughly a span of maybe 15, 20 years. But she builds for her family, so which meant every morning she would sit at the kitchen table and talk to dad, the prince, and they would decide what they were going to do, and off she went. Okay, this is an extreme example, but we do encounter people where there is relatively little resistance and, um, and others where um, the situation is more complicated. That goes for men as well. And so I think one has to get away from these, in both ways, from these very, very big generalizations and, and look at uh, situations in context and, um, right, and look at it in context. I think very broadly, um, men and women are not taken seriously on an, on an equal playing level. And one realizes kind of a consciousness about this the more women uh, get into architecture and they realize that on, on certain levels, they either aren't being taken seriously, it's harder to get a job, it's harder to get on a certain panel or be part of an organization or something like that. So um, the more women who enter into the, the profession, I think the more um, complicated the view becomes of it. And I think there used to be um, a sense of I'm going to be, I'm going to go into the profession, I'm going to be like a man, I'm not going to complain. And, and I think there's a changing sense of, I don't have to be that way. I, I am who I am. And of course, Germany is a very diverse society. So what is, it means to be a woman is very diverse. And I think those are issues that are kind of complicating this mindset. But those are very good questions to think about, and certainly themes for a conference where people can discuss their own experiences as well. Well, uh, I see another question, this time from Dorota Leśniak. There is a growing agenda of architecture of care, as it was formulated by Angelika Fitz and Elke Krasny in the exhibition organized by the Architectural Centrum Wien. A very uh, valuable input in time of the climate catastrophe. Do you think it has connection to women taking over the discipline? And if so, could it be more universally acclaimed also by male architects instead of architecture working as a tool of capital? And Great how? question. <laughs> I can't wait to answer it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Anyway, great question. Thank you very much. And Elke Krasny has basically an, a wonderful text about architecture and care in the book that's coming out, Architecture and Politics. Really a nice, um, really a nice text. 
Um, and I remember commenting on her her text for uh, for the introduction and um, this notion of, of care very broadly. Um, so it's not just building, you know, it's this, it's this larger commitment to society, to the environment and everything else. I think it's very interesting when we apply it to architecture and especially women in architecture, and you can send it to men in architecture as well, because in a, a lot of biographies of women architects, there's a break. You know, I work and then I stop because there's a family and then maybe I can get back in again or something, but there's there are these breakages. And we have a couple of biographies where, you know, there's this break because of children or family or caring for other people or whatever. And it's like, she's no longer an architect because the three kids at home or, <laughs> or whatever. But when you think about care, care is a way of uniting it all. Well, care is when you're building and preserving the environment and, and making healthier and sounder places for all us to exist in. And care is, you know, preserving life, taking care of your kids, your family, whatever it is you, you do to preserve life. So I think care is a way of just, not just rethinking architecture, but how we live, and then how we think about our own biographies as, as adult human beings as well. We think about women because rarely when you write an a biography of a male architect, you talk about his kids, you know, what he did with his kids or how the first birth of the first kid affected him. You certainly would do that with a woman architect. But when you, you expand it, as you suggest in your question, then it's really about rethinking about how we what we think about life and that architecture is really a part of life, caring for our families and building. Hmm. So I think it's a great question and, and I hope I hope uh, architecture can be reframed in some way. Well, I think we still need to discuss the future. Yeah. But actually, I have one question dedicated to the past. Uh, yesterday, I was in Wrocław, and uh, in the Museum of Architecture in Wrocław, I've seen exhibition about Hans Pelzig, Hans Pelzig from Wrocław to New York and back. It is about uh, a set of furniture uh, recently donated to the museum, mm -hmm. uh, a set that was built for the Brigger family from mm -hmm. Breslau, mm -hmm. then now Wrocław. And uh, the set of furniture was uh, transported by the Brigger family to New York once they escaped the Third Reich. Um, and um, uh, the exhibition is about Hans Pelzig, but uh, in the back, uh, there is also a story of his wife, Marlene Meszke Pelzig. Uh, you mentioned uh, this very amazing person uh, and uh, I would uh, be very happy if you could tell us a little bit more about her work, especially in terms of the furniture in the early years of the 20th century. Yeah, thank you. I mean, again, every woman here, I could talk for hours. They're all really fascinating personalities, but happily about Marlena. First of all, we included her in the exhibition for two reasons. One, um, many of the figures here are very obscure and Marlena, Everybody knows Hans Poltzig, so it was a way of helping people connect with the theme. Um, and the other thing was, you didn't have to train as an architect to be an architect in Germany. Peter Behrens, for example, trained as a painter. So it was important for us to show someone, for example, who trained in the arts. And she, as I mentioned, was a, um, the first woman who was admitted to the Art Academy in Hamburg. So it was very, Hamburg's a very wealthy city. It's a very important city in Germany. Was a very sophisticated art community and she was the first woman who was admitted. She uh, was a sculptor um, and has this very strong sculptural quality about her work. When she mm -hmm. finishes, she actually had a number of commissions from um, ceramic factories to develop sculptures that could then, then be mass produced. So she was very well known in her own time. How did she meet Hans Polzig? The story goes that around 1919, no, 1917, she shared a cab with F F Professor Poltzig in Berlin somewhere, and, and they kind of fell in love or hit it off or who knows, but they stayed in contact. And he was incredibly impressed by her artistic abilities. He was 25 years older, incredibly important architect. He would go on to become chief city architect in 
Dresden briefly and then go back to Berlin around 1920 or so when he becomes a professor there. But he was the one who really um, gave her the push to really not just be a sculptor, but really take her, her facility with three dimensions and then work in architecture. So he integrates her into his atelier and she takes on a leading role. And then they have three children and he, he divorces his wife and, and they were actually a very well-known couple. It's, it's assumed that she did was the major figure on a lot of the domestic projects. They did, they did a lot of houses in Berlin in the 20s at the Weissenhall, for example. There's a, a, a house by, by Polzig and also the Fishtal housing estate in Zehlendorf. And if you look at the furniture that she produced, um, everybody thinks of the 20s as uh, steel, you know, chrome steel furniture like Mies and, and Reich were doing, or that Korb and Perion would produce a little bit later on. But actually, if you look at a lot of the architectural production, most architects didn't really know what to do inside. I mean, they figured out modern architecture, but if you look at a lot of interiors, um, there's usually a very broad variety of what modern furniture could be, um, what materials, who, how can it be produced. And her work tends to be, I would say, heavier, incredibly sculptural, has a very strong presence, and she uses a lot of wood. And um, so this is kind of unusual, but I would say it was very well recognized during its time because it's this new contribution to, well, how should we live um, and, and what can furniture be like? I would say the difference is to Mies and, and Lily Wright, the Mies furniture is probably very well known. He was, oh, thank you, always thinking about making money. So he was very interested in mass producing his furniture. And that was one group of <laughs> architects. They want to mass produce them. They want to make some money. They want to get those patents. Uh, Marlena Poltzig and Hans Poltzig, they were incredibly successful. They had a lot, very lot, a lot of very large commissions. They earned a lot of money, were highly respected. And they did a lot of their furniture designs for either for single family homes or they did the Herbst office building in Frankfurt. And there was a lot of representative architecture where she did then the, the tables, the chairs, et cetera. So their clientele was different. It wasn't for house, you know, furniture for the masses. It was a very, you know, um, a select group where you're making individual items. And for that reason, you can have this very expensive material and craft processes as well. So that's why it looks different than what we think furniture from the 20s should be like, but actually it's part of this whole question of, you know, how should we live and what kind of furniture should we have for our modern interiors? Hmm. Professor Patrzynski, thank you so very much uh, once again for accepting our invitation. It was a great pleasure to learn so much about uh, German architecture from a different angle, from a different perspective. I think uh, we all need to uh, refigure and rethink what act actually the architecture practice is and how we treat um, the uh, producing the architecture, which uh, mm -hmm. sometimes is becoming so difficult, so problematic, so time consuming uh, that uh, not everyone can uh, simply uh, find uh, a space and find uh, an enjoyment uh, in this incredible uh, practices architecture actually is. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I should uh, also add that the exhibition about uh, Peltzig practice and Peltzig furniture is on uh, display in Wrocław until early fall. Uh, and uh, this August, women architects and politics in the long 20th century are going to be published. So we are all uh, waiting. Uh, and uh, once again, my great, great thanks. This was the fourth event of the 2022 Elements of Architecture series. This year, uh, this uh, spring and actually summer already, uh, we focus on women architects and we are going to be back this fall. So thank you so much for this evening. Goodbye.